you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here. You know, I was uh, at Red State three years ago in 2012. I had never been in politics, never run for anything. Eric and Red State supported me, and we ended up being successful there. And now I'm back, um, you know, running for the Senate. So it's very exciting. I'm very, very appreciative of, of Eric's support and Red State's support. You know, since I'm kind of new to this, people still come up to me and be like, I said, what you think? What do you guys do up there? You know, some people ask me about, you know, on C-SPAN when everybody's voting, how everyone's just running around the House floor talking. Like, what is that? And there's an interesting story about that. You know, we don't vote orally in the House. We have a voting card assigned to us. And there's different machines where you put the voting card in and press yes for yes, no for no. There is a present button, but I reserve that for Barack Obama, and I don't vote present. Um, but the card has your, your picture on it, U.S. House of Representatives, all this. So I use it a lot um, when you're up there because we take hundreds of votes. Well, about six months ago, my wife and I were out to dinner, and I was going to pay the bill. I thought I was grabbing my credit card, but I actually grabbed my House of Representatives voting card, and I put it in the bill. I didn't think anything of it. I didn't know I did it. Well, the server comes back. She opens the bill. She takes the card, sees my mug on it, sees House of Representatives, and said, sir, we don't accept this here. You're $18 trillion in debt. <laughs> and I said, how can I argue with that? But you think about it, I mean, it's, it's kind of a punchline that people say. It's obviously one of our big problems. We got all these other problems right now. We see that Planned Parenthood is running federally subsidized baby part meat markets. We see a toxic bureaucracy at the VA just treating our vets terribly. Uh, our border security is non-existent. The government tolerates sanctuary cities who flout the law. We have a stagnant economy that doesn't work for a lot of people. The stock market, I know, has been juiced by the easy money policies of the Fed, but that's not going to last forever. And of course, we have an Iran deal that proposes to give the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism $150 billion and provide international sanction to Iran's nuclear program. And, you know, it's interesting because the president said, oh, these Republicans in Congress who oppose this, they're basically making common cause with Iran's hardliners. Um, and I took offense to that because when I was serving in Iraq in 07 and 08, uh, the Iranian hardliners were the number one source of death for U.S. service members during that time. And under this president's deal, the sanctions on the ringleader of all that, the Quds Force commander, Qasem Soleimani, those sanctions, international sanctions, get removed on Soleimani. And so the president's uh, attacks on us, I think I take umbrage of. I guarantee you that the overwhelming majority of Iraq and Afghanistan vets who are serving in the Congress will vote against this deal. And I think the president's attacks on us, I think the president's attacks on us reveal him to be behaving like the petty demagogue that he is. But as big as all those problems are, I, I want to take just a few minutes to talk about, I think, an even bigger problem, something that I think undergirds everything, and that's the drift away from the country's founding principles and constitutional foundations. Because I think you can correct bad policies much easier than you can recover uh, the foundations that, that made the country great. Uh, when you take an oath of office to be a commissioned officer uh, or join the military, many of you may have done that. Um, and when you take an oath to serve in the Congress, you know, you're taking an oath not to uh, serve any particular political party or, or particular government. Um, you know, if you were joining the Chinese military, you take an oath to the Communist Party of China. If you were in other countries, maybe you take an oath to the crown. Well, here in America, we take an oath to the Constitution of the United States of America. And I think the reason that we do that, the reason that we do that is because the Founding Fathers understood you can put the best ideas in the world on paper, they can sound nice and pretty, just like our ideals in the Declaration of Independence do. But unless you have a system that provides a foundation so that free people really can govern themselves and pursue their dreams, then ultimately those ideals are not going to be able to carry the day. They knew that human history was marked with failed republic after failed republic, and they viewed the Constitution really 
as their contribution to showing that people really could govern themselves. And so it was interesting because a couple of months after I had taken office in the Congress, the President comes to uh, the House to give the State of the Union and he's doing his normal shtick. And then at one point he says, you know, uh, we need to fight global warming. I want you to do cap and trade or something. But if you don't do that, Congress, then I will. And I thought to myself, gee, that's not how the system is supposed to work. Um, but I didn't probably think much, you know, I didn't expect much more from the president. But then what really surprised me is I turned and looked to my left and my Democratic colleagues all stood up and started cheering him. And I thought to myself, you know, you realize he's threatening to turn you and our institution into a constitutional irrelevancy, but yet it didn't really seem to matter. And I think that the Democrats really have no interest at all in being good stewards uh, of the American Constitution and our founding principles. I mean, they've supported the president's EPA power grab, executive amnesty, and rewrites to Obamacare, even though each and every one of those represented direct attacks on the authority of the Congress. Heck, you even have Debbie Wasserman Schultz. She can't even explain the difference between a Democrat and a socialist. And so they're not going to help us with this. But I will say, and this is very, um, uh, uh, you know, I wish I could, I wish this wasn't the case, but the permanent GOP political class, particularly those in Washington, really have little interest in defending our, our founding principles either. Uh, certainly if it makes their pursuit or maintain a power inconvenient. I mean, that, that's going to yield, that duty will yield to things that I think are much more temporal and less um, important. And, and they'll always say, well, look, you know, we can't really worry about things like the Constitution. We have to, quote, show people that we can govern. And in Washington, that typically means moving big bloated bills through, you know, th getting the spending, all these things, catering to the interest in D.C. The thing is, the founding fathers, yeah, they believed 100 percent in the art of governing. Supporting and defending the Constitution is central to what it means to govern. And one of the things I'll hear from people, even Republicans who I serve with, will say, well, you know, you know, if something's unconstitutional, you know, we can still pass it and it, let the courts strike it down. They're going to be the ones who are going to tell us, you know, what to do. And, and I say, well, did you have your fingers crossed when you took the oath of office to support and defend the Constitution? That's not the way it's supposed to work. And not only that, but if we haven't learned by now that you can't depend on the courts to do the right thing, then when are we ever going to learn? We have our own duty to maintain our constitutional system of government. And I think drifting away from these principles has led us to this situation where in Washington, you really have a separate ruling class. Uh, where people live really under a different set of laws and rules than the rest of the American people. Um, and I know, because I've been in the fight on a couple of these things, one is fighting the congressional exemption from Obamacare. Yeah. You know, Obamacare, it imposes all types of inconveniences, costs on business, on individuals, and when those costs get imposed, what, what's the average American have to do? They have to, they have to eat it. They can't find a way around it, but yet when something inconveniences Congress, they find a way to create a special run around the law. And so right now you have, and I, I decline this because I think it's wrong, but you have many people getting an illegal subsidy um, and really um, not living under the law as it was written. And of course, when you have that type of culture, what do you expect when you see somebody like Hillary Clinton and how she's handled this classified information? I can tell you this, with a very high degree of certainty. When I was an active duty naval officer, if I had handled classified information the way that Hillary Clinton did, I would have been given a one-way ticket to an exotic location called Fort Leavenworth. But yet nothing seems to happen with Hillary Clinton. Why does she get to violate the law and not have any consequences attached to it. So there's a real, real problem right now, and I introduced last Congress, and I'm going to do it again, a constitutional amendment that's very simple. It simply says Congress can make no law applying to the citizens of the United States that does not also apply to the Congress and the Senate.
And I think that part of this separate culture has been this growth of this huge, unaccountable bureaucracy uh, that we have. And most of the things that are done by government that affect society are not even done by the Congress anymore. They're done by rules are issued by people who are nameless, faceless, who will never face the voters, and yet they have a profound effect on the economy, on our liberty. Um, and think about it, the Internal Revenue Service. So obviously they, they abused their authority, they targeted Americans. We've tried to get to the bottom of it in Congress. We've subpoenaed documents, we've brought the commissioner before. And what happens? The IRS destroyed 24,000 emails that were under a congressional subpoena. The IRS failed to, to deliver over 1,000 emails, which the inspector general then found. And the IRS commissioner has testified falsely in front of Congress. And I'm just thinking to myself, if you were the subject of an IRS audit, and you destroyed documents, and you didn't produce other documents, and you gave false testimony to them, would you be able to get away with that? Of course not. Um, and so you have one of the most powerful agencies uh, not only uh, misusing its power, but completely thumbing its nose at the American people. And so I think that part of the reason we're in this situation is because Congress has not used the constitutional authority that it has. Um, the first a check that we have against a bureaucracy is the power of the purse. Now, I will actually acknowledge that we defunded or we, we actually cut funding from the IRS last year. When Washington talks about cutting spending, they almost never actually mean cutting spending. But this time, the IRS got less in its budget. But guess what they did? They didn't use it. It didn't hurt the bureaucracy. All they did is took all the resources away from customer service. So taxpayers are calling the IRS and nobody's answering the phone. And so it didn't actually hurt the bureaucrats. It basically hurt the American people. So it was, it was the right thing to do, but they were able to maneuver around it. And so I look at it, I say the second, um, I think, critical check is impeachment of civil officers. Any civil officer in the bureaucracy can be impeached. And so Jim, Congressman Jim Jordan and I have uh, called for the president to remove IRS Commissioner Koskinen, but if they, he is not removed, then we are going to create um, and draft articles of impeachment uh, so that we can remove him from office in the Congress. You know, we tried to do this with Lois Lerner when we held her in contempt, and that was fine, but the problem with the contempt is in order to enforce that, you need Obama's Justice Department to bring the case, and that is not going to happen. Uh, if you impeach a civil officer, that is all done within the Congress. The executive branch is not a part of it at all. And look, I don't know what a Democrat would do with someone like Commissioner Koskinen, but I think it's a bad vote if this guy... Uh, oversaw emails being destroyed, testified falsely before Congress, all that. What kind of standard are you setting? I think people like that should have to have a higher standard than the average taxpayer. The Democrats would essentially be saying it's okay if they have a lower standard. And I think that's a very bad place to be in politically. And another thing to deal with the bureaucracy that I think we could probably do with a Republican president, no regulation, major regulation that is issued should be allowed to take effect unless it is approved by both houses of Congress. Because, because you need to have the ability to hold somebody accountable if government is acting against your interests. And right now, you can give the bureaucracy all this power, they issue the rules, and the elected officials are not held accountable by making the elected officials go on the record. One, we'll be able to stop a lot of bad things, but if we betray your interests, then you can vote the people who did that. And I think that's very, very important. Um, you know, part of what the founders understood was just an ethos of limited government. They didn't want no government because then you wouldn't have protection for property rights, individual liberty, but they obviously did not want an all-encompassing government. And I think we're really witnessing a lot of the perils of big government now. I mean, part of the reason the founders wanted limited government is, yes, they wanted it to protect individual freedom, but they also understood the more things government got involved in, the less likely it would be able to do any of those things competently. And if you have a government that's focusing on the really big national issues, now it's still a government or still a bureaucracy, but man, you probably would do a better job. Now we have a situation where the government will regulate how much water our toilet can flush, and yet it can't even do basic things like securing our southern border. Um, and that is because the government is getting involved in way, way too many things. I think what big government also does, and this is very plain, is it fosters a culture of cronyism in which 
political connections count for more than what you're actually doing in the marketplace. And we see this right now in Washington. Right now, six of the 10 wealthiest counties in our country are suburbs of DC. I can tell you, they ain't producing shale in, in Washington. We don't have finance or, or technology or not. I mean, it's all because of the growth of government and the premium that gets paid when people can bend the political process to benefit certain discrete ish, uh, interests. And in fact, um, I think it was either last year or the year before, the number one fastest growing part of the country was North Dakota because they have this shale boom. Number two was Washington, D.C. So I think we need a country in which uh, the rest of America is growing and Washington is being reduced in size and influence. I'll tell you. And here's, I think, very important, because the Democrats act like, you know, they want to spend more, tax more, regulate more, grow the government more, because they want to look out for kind of the little guy. But I got news for you. Big government hurts the little guy. It does not help the little guy. And if you need evidence of that, look at the two biggest things that Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi did, Dodd-Frank and Obamacare. Dodd-Frank, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan, said that Dodd-Frank was a benefit to them because it gave them a competitive advantage and it kept competitors from being able to intrude on their turf. Um, and I think you've seen that. What Dodd-Frank has done, it hasn't really held Wall Street accountable. It's hurt our community banks. And so a lot of these guys have a tough time even staying in business. And then with Obamacare, we heard how they were going to hold the insurance companies accountable. The insurance companies are now all consolidating. So you're only going to end up having three or four insurance companies nationwide. That is very bad for consumers and that's going to cause prices to increase. Um, you look at the formation of small businesses, we're at potentially a historic low, but certainly at a 30-year low, um, and that's because it's too cumbersome and too costly to be able to start up a business. It used to be you can get in your garage and someone like Steve Jobs can create Apple. Much more difficult to do that now because of the growth of government. And here's the thing. When government grows, when government engages in cronyism, when government uh, has a huge regulatory burden, it imposes costs on the people who can least afford it. The people who are middle income, low income, their health care costs go up because of Obamacare. Because we have ethanol mandates, that causes the cost of groceries to go up. Um, because of the uh, student loan policies, it makes college more and more expensive. And so while government may be saying it's trying to help people, it's actually making it more difficult for people to get ahead in life. I think another prob peril of big government is that it infringes, of course, on our liberties, but in particular, our religious liberty. Um, and if you look at what's happened with things like Obamacare, government is getting so involved into so many different decisions that as that happens, there is no way around it. That is going to come up against the rights of conscience. And I was very, very uh, uh, shocked when the Solicitor General of the United States during the uh, same-sex marriage argument told the court that he believes that yanking churches and synagogues tax-exempt status would be something that would potentially be on the table if the court constitutionalized the redefinition of marriage. And so you may be in a situation where government is going to leverage its coercive power against religious institution as pressure for them to change their doctrine. And these are doctrines that have existed for millennia. Uh, that, to me, I think, is a threat that goes to the heart of our religious liberty. I think it's going to be very, very important if we do elect a, uh, a new pres a Republican president uh, that we don't make any more mistakes on nominating justices to the U.S. Supreme Court. And I can tell you that I will be there with people like Mike Lee making sure that we do not have another David Souter and we do not have another Chief Justice John Roberts. The I'm not asking a, a judge to get, create any specific political outcomes. The one thing that I will insist on is that that individual understands the proper role and function of the courts, and it is simply to exercise judgment, not to legislate or rewrite our laws and constitution. And when Chief Justice Roberts did that with Obamacare, that was political and that was wrong, and we can't repeat those mistakes again going forward. 
let me just say one final thing just about kind of in Washington, you know, um, some of the folks will, will say, oh, well, you know, you, you know, if you're conservative, you, you guys, you know, you don't want to compromise, you don't want to do any of this stuff. And, and, and I think the word compromise means something different in Washington. You know, the Founding Fathers deliberately created a system that separated powers, that had checks and balances, and they actually didn't want one individual to always get their way. So me, I know nothing that I vote on is ever perfect, even bills I write they're not the ideal bill I write because I have to look to try to see, okay, I need to get support for this or whatever. So the idea that, you know, there are different interests at stake, you're not going to get everything you want, that's to the heart of what the Founding Fathers understood. But in Washington, when they say that people need to compromise more, what they mean is Democrats get most of what they want, big government Republicans get a little of what they want, and we send the bill to our grandkids. That is not something that I think is going to save the country. And so just understand when people say that the founders believed in compromise, they did, and, and, and it's absolutely crucial to governing, but it's got to be compromises that are moving us in the direction of more liberty, more freedom, um, and a better society. And So why is all this important? Because, you know, I believe that the reason our country is unique is because we were founded on certain uh, indelible truths uh, that reflect human nature, individual liberty, that our founding fathers were wise enough to construct a system that would protect our liberty and allow it to pr pr uh, preserve itself for the future. Um, and I go back, I think of Abraham Lincoln. He spoke to the Ohio Regiment towards the end of the Civil War, um, and he pointed out that um, the virtue of a free government like we have is that it gives people an open field and fair chance for their industry, enterprise, and intelligence to flourish. And he said, you know, somebody, some of you may be in my father's spot, where my father now has me, who really had no advantages, sitting in this great big white house. And the promise of America is no matter where your circumstances, you could end up exceeding um, your wildest dreams. And so for me, that's really what it all, it's all about. And Lincoln pledged them. He said, I think it's worth fighting for such an inestimable jewel. And so that's why I'm running for the Senate. I think that we have very little time uh, to save the country. Uh, I'm going to be doing all I can to not only win my election, but to help us win, uh, usher in a new administration, and really get to work by turning the country around. So thank you all for being here. God bless everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And I didn't say very much about the Senate race, but I should know uh, one of the Democrats who's running is a congressman from Orlando named Alan Grayson. I thought you guys may like that. So, um, you know, you can feel free. Um, go to DeSantis2016.com if you want to find out more about what we're doing. You know, we'd obviously love to have you on our team. Hi, right, guys. Am I on here? All right. Got a couple questions for you, Congressman DeSantis. I have a question from Bob from Pennsylvania who wants to know, do you support the ethanol renewable fuel standard? Do I support repealing it? Do you support, yeah, I guess, yes, that's probably the question. Either way you want to answer it, positively so, or negatively. So I think the question, do I support the, re the ethanol mandate, the renewable fuel standard, I think we need to repeal it as soon as possible. <laughs> Another question that I'm sure is, is on a lot of people's minds here. Uh, if it comes down to uh, a fight over a continuing resolution in September, would you support a shutdown of the government over the Planned Parenthood funding issue? Well, here's the thing, and I think we run the risk of buying into the Democrat narrative. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if we were to vote for funding uh, for the government and redirect money away from Planned Parenthood because they're running this obscene meat market and baby parts, we will be the ones to vote to fund the government. So I think the question would be more for the Democrats and Harry Reid to say, are you willing to stop funding for the government because you're so insistent that Planned Parenthood uh, be allowed to continue to maim uh, babies. Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is, but I can tell you there's not a lot of journalists that ask them that question. Um, but certainly I'm not going to be voting to, to fund uh, Planned Parenthood. All right, thank you very much. Congressman Ron DeSantis, thank you very much for your time.